Hello and welcome to a keynote session for Net Zero Week. We're looking to, at the moment at decarbonizing transport, which is the whole issue around whether you go elect electrification, as is obviously going great guns, or whether hydrogen has a role to play, certainly with heavy transport and, and other forms like aviation and shipping. And so on. Obviously, a lot of you will be more interested in the EV side and the fleet. We've got an interesting panel today, and do do get involved in the discussion and um, use the question pane on your right and just ask questions throughout the um, throughout the presentations and in the debate, and I will then put them to the panel. Um, so to kick off, we kick off with Andy Eastlake from Zemo Partnership. Andy, give us the background. Thank you, Tim. Uh, hopefully, you can. See my slide there now. If you can confirm that, Tim, just uh, that uh, the slide is yeah. showing. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. But great. Decarbonizing transport. Uh, this this couldn't have come at a better time. I think it's fair to say, uh, given that uh, only yesterday uh, the Department for Transport published their decarbonizing transport strategy, which really does summarise uh, what we face and how we're going to go about it. Um, but prior to that, I thought it's just worth uh, giving a quick overview because some of you may not have come across Zemo Partnership before. Um, we were previously called the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership, Low CVP, established uh, about almost 20 years ago now, um, and really aiming to pick up this agenda of low carbon vehicles and the opportunities for the UK. <clears throat> but obviously in those days, in uh, 2002, 2003, we were talking about hybrid vehicles. I think the Prius had just been launched, um, and there was really very little in the way of alternative fuels. Electric vehicles, I think, were in the uh, the dream space. Uh, we were definitely talking about hydrogen fuel cell buses at the time as being the next big thing, um, but uh, it was a different world and a different time. Um, we've been set. We were set up to bring all of the key stakeholders together, and I think that's a theme that you'll hear through today. Is about this principle of partnership and working together that is even more important now than it was uh, 20 years ago. But the aim is within the partnership to bring the people who provide the vehicles, the people who control the policy, the people who use the vehicles and energy, and indeed people like the academics and the, uh, the thinkers and the uh, in environmental NGOs all around the same table to grapple with the issues. Uh, and we've been supporting the government's agenda for that period. Now, the way we do that uh, is to actually um, build the communities with a common goal. And the common goal we've all had behind us for the last, uh, since 2007, has been the Climate Change Act. Uh, and in 2007, that was set to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions here in the UK to 80% of their 1990 levels by 2050. And that was what we were working with uh, for the first uh, 10, 10 or 12 years of our existence. As many of you will remember, in 2019, the UK was the first economy to commit to a net zero target. Uh, a net zero means there is nowhere to hide. And, and I remember the days when everybody thought they were part of the 20% that didn't necessarily have to decarbonize. And now everybody's in the same boat. Energy, transport, industry, buildings, you name it, agriculture, we've all got to get to net zero. So what we do is bring the communities together. We, we build the evidence base and look at the research, and then we get involved in developing the policy. And we've been very closely involved with the Department for Transport and Bays around these things. And then the other key piece, and part of what we're doing here today, is really accelerating the market based on solid and sound understanding of the problems and understanding and development of the policy. We can then accelerate the market at the right pace and in the right direction to actually deliver that. Um, and the way we do that is through our range of reports, all of which are publicly available. Um, but let's get into the meat of today. Um, yesterday, the, the, uh, the government, uh, the Department of Transport, issued their decarbonizing transport plan. This has been a plan that's been long in the gestation. Uh, many of us have been working on this and waiting for it for, for quite a while. Um, but it does, it does really represent a step change in how transport will be considered and how we will work together. And I think that's a, the key point to deliver on the net zero agenda. It's 16 months of workshops and submissions and consultations, and it feels like I've been involved in every single one of those. I don't think I have. What we have, though, in the document is 79 commitments to actual tangible actions, and I think that's a really, really key point. 
There's over 220 pages which really look at every aspect of transport. So obviously I'll start by going through every single one of those 220 pages. If you've all got time for that, that's fine. Um, what we do have as headlines is we've got a lower greenhouse gas, we've got to increase the efficiency of the system, and we've also got to look at less traffic. And, and that's a key point. We've really got to think about how we remove traffic and make it more efficient uh, within this whole area. We've got opportunities in every area. Technology is the big feature. Zero emission vehicles, uh, sustainable fuels for planes, electric trains, uh, even ships and ammonia for ships. But actually, the opportunities extend far beyond just those sort of headline shiny technologies. There are key opportunities in the energy space, and Phil New, one of my colleagues, will be talking about that. Behavior is a critical opportunity. The way we behave, the way we order our goods, the way we move about. Financial incentives, data-driven transport, measurement of these things and reporting, the communication, the research, the innovation, all of these areas, even geographical, place-based solutions will be critical. I think the key thing I'd like to take away from this is this plan is ambitious. There are some clear statements about what we need to do and when we need to do it by, and that's probably the thing that will be arguably scaring some of the fleets out there, which we, we really want to sort of try and help you through. One sort of key summary slide, if you like, as I say, I won't go through the 220 pages, but I think what we can pick out of this is um, initially a focus on increasing walking and cycling and active travel. So that's got to be a good thing. The more we can remove vehicles, if you like, from our mobility requirements, uh, the better. Um, there's a, there's a, within that, there's a shifting of freight to rail trying to get freight off the roads and onto rail, which is an efficient way of moving particularly heavy freight, uh, and indeed last mile activities, looking at zero emissions in the last mile. Key headline is every new road vehicle by 2040 will be zero emissions. Now that means vans, trucks, motorcycles, we already have cars uh, within that, uh, but heavy trucks have got to be zero emissions by 2040. And in fact, the smaller trucks uh, will have to be earlier than that by 2035. There's also a really, really key element, and, and one of the things that we've been doing together with, with Phil is bringing together the energy and infrastructure sector, because it's very different now with electric vehicles and indeed hydrogen than it was with the automotive and oil sectors, able to operate arguably in, in separate silos. Also within this is a, a real commitment to reforming and informing planning and local policy. And, and that again, I think you'll hear from Phil, some of the challenges we have around the energy sector planning combined with transport planning and obviously domestic and, uh, and, and building planning. And bringing those together uh, is going to be critical and is highlighted within this. There's actually quite a key focus on renewable fuels. The biggest opportunity in the short term will be through decarbonizing the fuel we use in the 40 million vehicles that are currently on the road. We've got to progress to zero emission vehicles, there's no doubt about that, but that's a 19 year program in terms of road. Uh, and during those 19 years, we've got to radically reduce the carbon emitted from our vehicles and the greenhouse gas emitted from our vehicles, even from the existing vehicles. So there is a clear focus on a strategy to increase our renewable fuel quantity, and that will ultimately end up in aviation and possibly marine. So it's, it's an investment that we need to make for the long term, as well as uh, a, a real commitment for the short term. And I think another key point that I'd like to highlight is there's a focus in here, arguably for the first time, around how do we minimize the number of vehicles on our roads? How do we make shared, responsive, flexible, and what I've said here, data-rich transport, part of the solution for our communities and our commutes uh, in the future? So I think there's a lot to grapple with here and a lot that fleets will need to, uh, need to take on board. But I think the ambition shouldn't be scary. We have the technology. It's about now implementing that technology across the vehicle sector. Um, I think I, I will sort of wrap up there, but I think the key thing that uh, I wanted to leave you with is that now is absolutely the time to be grappling with this as fleets. Now is the time to be thinking about the next vehicle you buy, the next purchase of fuel. And what we've got here today within the panel are hopefully a community that can really help you with that. What the government have done is give us a framework of legislation and indeed a framework of collaboration. And this webinar today and the, the community, the, the panelists you see in front of you, are part of that solution to helping fleets 
with every aspect of how they decarbonize. Um, at that point, I will hand over. The only thing I would say is that uh, the TDP itself probably didn't make as much of the news as it should have done yesterday, uh, but we are hoping next Tuesday within our annual conference to really uh, look under the hood of this, this policy and this plan and start to dig into the details on what that means for fleets and for real people. Um, I'll stop there and, and hand over, I think, to, uh, to Phil New, who, um, who's been working with us and we've been working with him around how we join up automotive and uh, the energy sector. And I think Phil can, uh, can treat you to some of his thoughts in that sector. Great. Thanks, Andy. I'll just check that uh, everyone can hear me. Great. Yep, no, uh, so uh, thank you very much for, for that introduction. So uh, uh, Philip New, I'm the CEO of the Energy Systems Catapult, but for the purposes of uh, uh, this webinar, uh, I'm also the chair of the, uh, the Ministerial Electric Vehicle Energy Task Force, um, which was set up uh, around about two and a half years ago uh, with the goal of um, trying to produce a set of recommendations and proposals that make the charging infrastructure as consumer friendly, as user friendly as it possibly can be, but within the context of the transition of the overall energy system as a whole, as it moves to net zero to in pursuit of the goals that uh, Andy laid out there around the, uh, the, the net zero targets that we have as an economy. To Andy's point about, you know, now is the time. Um, uh, yeah, so this morning, the headline in my newspaper was actually around the fact that the Amazon has become a net emitter of CO2 rather than a carbon sink. So it feels as though, you know, that, that I found remarkably sobering as a, a thing to wake up to. Uh, uh, that is, you know, just another really important indicator of the urgency that we face around this. And we have to bear in mind that in the UK economy, transport is the sector that has the largest emissions at the moment. Um, so, uh, to turn then back to what's happening with, uh, uh, with the EV task force, um, it has been a remarkable process of pulling together stakeholders from across the entire ecosystem that is involved with the development of infrastructure, an entirely new infrastructure, to support the charging of electric vehicles um, as, as we see the electrification of the vehicle fleet progress. So it's included people from, of course, uh, the classic traditional parts of the energy industry, whether that's uh, renewable energy generators, uh, the distribution and transmission networks, and the energy supply companies. It's included the charge point operators, this new and emerging sector of the economy, it included uh, representatives from the auto sector, uh, but also uh, uh, people from the built environment, uh, from our towns and our cities. So it was a, a really all in brown and a lot of people from the tech sector as well. Uh, so we tried to make it as representative as possible. In the process of the, uh, of the task force so far, uh, we've engaged with over uh, 350 individual companies. Uh, and we've run a series of uh, work groups and, uh, and seminars. Uh, a year and a half ago, uh, we were able to publish the initial report of the, uh, of the task force. And its findings were very much focused on the interventions that this community, this cross-sectoral uh, ecosystem, uh, could all align around as being the key things that needed to happen uh, in a few areas to enable uh, the outcomes we were pushing on. The first was a strong focus on the absolute importance of smart charging. Just to put that into some degree of context here, you know, we're going to be at least doubling the amount of electricity that we're going to be using in the economy between now and 2050. A proportion of that, but not all of that, but a proportion of that uh, will be uh, uh, devoted to uh, the electrification of transport and supplying transport. Um, if we don't use smart charging, 
then the peak strain that is put on the system is going to be really significant and it will require a lot more investment to make sure that we have a system that is able to meet the requirements both of our charging and of our heating our homes and doing everything else that we're already using electricity for. It will be a significant extra cost compared with what we're already facing to transform the system. Smart charging and recognizing that the vehicle battery is going to be or has the potential to be uh, a, an integrated component of the electricity system in a way that to Andy's point the fuel the, the, the fuel tank in an internal combustion engine car was never really an in, integral component of the oil and gas system uh, but being taking taking advantage of the role of the battery uh, becomes a really significant opportunity um, uh, for, for us to be able to improve the user friendliness and reduce the cost of delivering the infrastructure that we need. Aligned with that, another major theme was interoperability, making it as easy as possible for consumers to be able to charge their car when they want to, where they want to, and with whom they want to. Trying to encourage the competition front between different suppliers to be around price and service and not around other barriers uh, that, that, that might lock consumers in and restrict their choice. The point here was to try and make the opportunity as broad as possible so that people find it as easy as possible and as welcoming as possible uh, to convert from, uh, uh, from, from petrol and diesel uh, to, to, to electricity. Another theme was around consumer engagement ensuring that individual users as they start to get used to working with this new system this new way of uh, charging their car have uh, the protections but also the information that they need to feel confident about making the change and 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 feel empowered about how they work within this new environment as andy pointed to a critical theme was about local planning and integrating what was going to be needed for uh, enabling the infrastructure for car charging uh, to work as part of the broader changes to transport planning and energy planning in our towns and cities. Um, so they were the broad themes sitting beneath them. There was a lot of thinking around what needs to happen around the evolution of standards and what needs to happen around data, data access, data sharing and data security. Um, so that was the essence of the first package of outputs from the, the task force. Since then, both the industry representatives who are very active around the task force and uh, policy and regulatory stakeholders have all been very clear that they want to see this continue. They saw value in, in this community being brought together and these collaborations being forged. And, and so uh, we have been doing a lot more work to deepen and become more specific in the recommendations around data, data sharing, uh, standards, uh, interoperability, uh, consumer engagement, and local planning. And now the focus is moving increasingly towards understanding what more needs to be done to support the development of a really effective public, in, uh, public charging infrastructure and network. Uh, and so to that end, we are working in close alignment with the auto sector and other stakeholders to develop a minimum viable system and articulation of what a minimum public charging network would look like in order to support the delivery of the goals in the government's 10-point plan. In other words, the uh, phasing out of sales of new uh, IC vehicles between 2030 and 2035. So that's where we are with the task force. Um, it's been really interesting seeing how you know a new glossary uh, has had to emerge as different uh, players and, and actors from different sectors try to talk and and and, and engage with each other different parts of the, the ecosystem use the same words for different things or different words for the same thing so that needed to be ironed out and that's happened i think we've created an environment where honest conversations can happen between and across stakeholders uh, and people understand the perspectives and constraints 
that, that they might otherwise have uh, not been as aware about. So that's, I think, been helpful. The, one of the challenges or conversations that I think has been, you know, most, uh, most, most difficult really, has been getting the balance right between consumer protection and providing the freedoms for the innovations that are going to enable brilliant new offerings to emerge and, and you know, go too far one way uh, and it can have some unintended consequences going too far the other way can have some unintended consequences. The debates around getting the balance right, the Goldilocks moment uh, between those two extremes uh, or those, 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 those two pressures uh, has been uh, something that has lived with us all the way through and I, I think is something that will remain as a live and important debate uh, through the through the the, the rest of the, the the task forces journey anyway so that's where we are we've got a range of uh, reports that are shortly going to come out the most important one perhaps being um, uh, around the business models uh, and the evolution of business models for the uh, investment of significant private capital in public charging infrastructure and aligned with that uh, some work that has been done to really understand the needs of fleet and commercial operators. Um, and, you know, for from the task force's perspective, um, the needs of commercial fleet are really important because to a great extent, they become, they can become the kind of the edge use case that then helps set the, uh, the, the, the insights and, and, and the recommendations uh, that can apply for the, the rest of the transition. If we can get the infrastructure right that works for the requirements of commercial fleets, then the likelihood is that it will work for the rest of the economy. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll finish and look forward to hearing from everyone else. Thank you, Philip. That's great. Um, we'll go straight on to some of the other panelists. So we get um, Simon Pickett. Can you give SSEs view on the decarbonisation of transport, please? Hi, Tim. Yeah, thanks, everybody. And um, apologies on behalf of Kevin Wellstead, who can't attend at short notice today. Um, I think it's really interesting seeing uh, the, the number of conferences and events that have happened digitally this year and the, the momentum we really have in this sector now in the decarbonisation and net zero agendas. And um, I'm sure a lot of us had quite a late night reading 220 pages and then 57 pages and all the other documents that came out. So uh, fantastic to see it. And I think that, that both the, the transport decarbonisation plan um, and the delivery plan have taken a big step forward um, in bringing to life a lot of the hard work that's been done behind the scenes by um, various different bodies um, and, and organisations and industries over the last three or four years. Um, I think it's interesting to note actually some of the, the terminology. We released our SSC green print last year and I was pleased to see that green print terminology kind of continue. Um, and I think Andy and Phil both stated that this is all about collaboration. You know, the investment has to come from private, from government, um, from, from all over the place. Um, and, and SSE is, is wholly committing to that. So our green print pulled out £7.5 billion pounds of investment. Um, we completed 11.4 ter terawatt hours of renewable generation output in 2019 to 20. Um, and that's going to continue to grow. We're investing in wind, we're investing in solar, we're investing in EV charging and networks. Um, what underlines all of that is, is safety, and I think that also aligns very much with net zero. Everything we do must be safe, it must be good quality, it must be reliable. Um, we have a mantra that in, in SSE that if it's not safe, we don't do it. And I think actually we need to sort of reflect that in our, in our transport plans, and, and air quality is increasingly important in cities. Um, I think economics is, is one thing, and I think you know social input and social reform will will improve that. I, I think we discussed planning already, but the important, importance of planning and development having a, a carbon impact or carbon reflection in what we do is really important and, and gone are the days of just build, build, build. Everything has to be um, done with, with a consideration for the future and for net zero now, um, and, and we will absolutely support that. I believe we're now expecting by the end of the year a mandate for smart charging on home charges. Um, and as, as well as seeing smart charging across all of the, the infrastructure on the road networks. Um, so yeah, we're, we're moving in the right direction. The energy sector, having worked in a couple of different major energy businesses, is, is working very hard behind the scenes to make sure all the capabilities are there. Um, and I think we will see that continue to uh, improve over a period of time. 
Um, if we can jump to the next slide, I think we've covered um, you know, most of what SSE is, but just to give you a view of, of exactly where we, I sit within the business and what my day-to-day -day role is, um, I, I sit in a business called Energy Solutions, um, so we're under a, a, the umbrella of the SSE group, so we have our renewables business, which is, I say, rapidly growing and delivering us that energy that we need to be able to see the transition and to do it in a green, clean way. We have our SSE thermal business and obviously our regulated side of the business in, in Scottish and Southern Energy and Electricity Networks. Um, I think it's really nice to have those group of companies working together because it gives us the ability to do that collaboration piece um, and to, to be able to impact on all parts of that supply chain from the energy sector. Um, but inevitably, energy is only one part of that kind of collision of transport and energy, which we're seeing, and, and over the period of time of the next 10 years, I think that will become increasingly intertwined, and fleets and energy companies will have much, much more contact. You know, got, got the days of turning up and fueling up at wherever is convenient. Energy will become planned, it will become more efficient, it will possibly become more cost-effective, um, and, and obviously it will become cleaner. Um, so that's, that's a, a bit of an overview on SSE Group. Um, in terms, of, in terms of, of, of myself, my role is slightly different to I think most of the guys on the rest of the panel. Um, so I, I sit on the front line as an EV project development manager, so I'm responsible for deploying technology, um, which is it, it absolutely fantastic to do it. Um, our focus as a business is on supporting um, commercial vehicles and, and commercial fleets primarily at the moment. So we're deploying EV hubs across the UK and Ireland. Um, our, our plans are, are just coming together now and we'll be releasing some details in the near future. Um, and we've also been heavily involved in the bus sector already. So deploying the largest electric vehicle bus depot in Europe so far. And we've got a, a working with Go Ahead London, we've been deploying a, a bus to grid trial site there, which is really, really interesting and fantastic to see. Um, and I think all those activities will provide valuable lessons learned and insight as the rest of them. UK's fleets um, get up to speed. Um, notably, we've also committed to EV100, and I'm sure everyone who's listening is already aware of EV100, but it's a commitment by uh, the majority, I would argue now, of, of large corporate fleets in the UK to electrify their fleet by 2030. Uh, I think incentives like that, or, or organisations like that, are critical to ensure that we do get that, that transition happening at, at pace. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the second-hand market, that will probably largely be driven by large corporate fleets making commitments and putting their hands in their pockets to convert. Um, and I think you know that combination of, of um, initial investment and the transition through to second-hand fleets is, is what needs to happen. Um, and, and we see that happening kind of now. We're converting our own fleet at pace and working very closely with our, our, our fleet team and facilities team to make sure that the infrastructure that goes in today is fit for purpose in 5, 10, 15 years' time or can be easily adjusted as things change. Um, I think also in terms of our deployments of, of hubs, we're looking to make sure we can focus on those who can't easily get access to charging. So off-street off -street parking is available for some, but not all. So where we've got commercial vehicle charging hubs, we will also look how we can um, append those to communities. So communities and, and blocks of flats and people with only on-street parking have access to more than just um, you know, lamppost charging or, or, or um, yeah, on, on workplace charging opportunities. Um, I think there's only one, one more point I'd, I'd like to cover off, and that is that data is going to be increasingly important. Um, obviously, over the next five years, as we connect more things to the energy network, as that, that demand increases, we need to be smarter, we need to be more um, aligned with how we use things, and we need to do things like, you know, daytime charging for fleets where they need it, or overnight charging for fleets and then using that grid connection for, for others who can, who can benefit from that rather than increasingly adding more and more connections. Um, I think that was actually called out in the, uh, the transport decarbonisation plan to say that data is going to be increasingly important and, and um, we welcome further collaboration in, in that space. Um, that's probably enough from me. I think I'll, uh, I'll hand back now. I'll look forward to the questions. And thank you, everybody. Sorry, thank you. That's brilliant, Simon. Um, and now we're going to Paul Ayres, founder, CDO of Connected Curb, and give us your views on maybe some of the practical issues that are facing decarbonisation. Yeah, will do. Thanks very much, Tim. Do you want to head on to the next slide? 
Um, so um, initially, I'd just like to say thanks very much indeed to the co-panelists uh, today and more importantly to those people out there having a listen to what we have to say. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have the chance to talk to you all. Uh, and this is certainly an interesting day to do so in the sense that um, as both uh, Andy, Phil um, uh, and indeed um, Simon have mentioned, um, the government's announcements yesterday were far reaching. Um, we're incredibly pleased it connected Curb with those announcements. Um, they've been a long time coming, and I know there's been a huge amount of hard work that's gone in right across the board among all the stakeholders in the industry to try and move the needle uh, closer to an environment where we see the empowerment, and I guess it's fundamental to who we are at connected Curb, is to accelerate the, tr the transition to e-mobility uh, and to do so in a manner that takes everybody on that journey. Uh, we don't want to leave anybody behind. We want to ensure that everybody thrives, all the stakeholders thrive, right all the way from the consumers, consuming transport and mobility services, all the way through to the existing constituents, and let's hope some perhaps of the new constituents that will move into the industry and start to disrupt and accelerate innovation. And we're already seeing some fascinating companies in those categories. Uh, could I have the next slide, please, Tim? Um, what I thought I'd do is Connected Curb are principally, we're a, an electric vehicle infrastructure business and a smart cities infrastructure business. We've been lucky enough to operate in this marketplace for four or five years now. And I guess there are some learnings I wanted to share with you today. Uh, and those learnings, I think, will echo some of the things that have already been said by the other panelists. So I won't bang the drum too loud. But we view mobility as something that's changing from a rather esoteric, siloed delivery mechanism into something that's integrated, uh, as Philip was saying, something that's multimodal, that's going to see people change the way in which they consume transport to become more efficient, both economically and environmentally. Um, notionally, also, we see transport becoming more of a consumable, so something that people can have and then dispose of once they've used it. So the traditions of uh, me growing up in the West Country, having to have a car at the age 17 so I could get from A to B, are long gone because those mindsets are changing and travel and transport services will change accordingly. Notionally, we want to start to see an environment where we're delivering a set of apposite solutions for customers to consume transport to enable them to achieve their objectives. But there are six lenses, I guess, that we look through as a business when we look at the transport and mobility industry. I just wanted to share those with you very quickly. And as I've said, many of these things have already been spoken about today. But we do see, conceptually, this convergence occurring in mobility, where the landscape as such is driven by consolidation and collaboration. There are no more, we think, opportunities for people to be in siloed walled gardens. You have to break down that interoperability challenge and do so in a manner that most benefits the critical constituent in the ecosystem. And that critical consist con uh, constituent basically make no bones about it is the consumer it's being able to deliver transport services that range across a gamut of different types of e-mobility and transport that enable something to be delivered on deck that makes the consumer engage and how are we seeing that happen we're seeing it happen principally not interestingly just through infrastructure which has got a long way to go but we're seeing that enabled by digital services and to that end Everything we do has to be connected, absolutely everything. Cars, connection points, electric vehicle charge points, assets, consumers. If we're going to encourage change, we have to put digital services at the heart of what we do. I've already mentioned the importance of consumers, but I'll bang that drum again. Because consumers' expectations are changing and because their ability to consume travel and transport services is changing, if you don't put the consumer front and center, and we're very aware of this as, a, as an infrastructure vendor and as a service provider. If you don't put the consumer front and center, you are likely to fail. So it's everything that makes these uh, opportunities for the consumer to engage is fundamental to all the things we're about to talk about and perhaps debate a little bit later. Uh, I mentioned infrastructure earlier. I'll mention it again. Infrastructure is sadly lacking. And traditional infrastructure, first generation electric vehicle infrastructure, doesn't echo some of the ambition that the government announced yesterday. Conceptually, private charge points having to be smart charge points. Notionally, interoperability standards, the removal of these 
networks of charging where EV owners, and I'm sure those of you who've got EVs will know this, you have to be a member of five or six different subscription-based services in order to get a fluid experience of charging. We need to eradicate those issues, remove the barriers, remove friction, and make this easier to access. Um, other things that are worthy of mention, first is the speed of innovation. So I've been in the industry, I guess, four or five years. What I've seen in that time coming from an internet and data perspective is something that is in step with the fastest innovation markets I've experienced in my career. And so if you don't have an eye on future innovation, and Philip spoke about things like utilizing these mobile batteries that exist in cars, for example, to contribute to grid and to change the way in which grid balancing works to enable some of the ambition that we're talking about today. Things like that sound almost Star Trek-like, but believe me, they're a matter of months, if uh, and worst case, a couple of years away. When we start to see these innovations, we have to accommodate those innovations now in our planning to ensure that they can be easily embraced as and when they reach maturity from a commercial perspective and from a technology perspective. And then finally, again, we've spoken about this a little bit. One of the massive hurdles that we've to face is the transition from the government funding all of the infrastructure and all of the transition that we're talking about to finding lures and opportunities to demonstrate to the private uh, organizations out there that make investment, private equity uh, and the like. How do we make this a compelling investment opportunity for them? And so I think some of the work that's been done by the DFT and by the Office of Low Emission Vehicles and now OZEV it has been absolutely formative in seeing what we're seeing now is an early adopt community of private investors looking to make strategic investments in the whole infrastructure that will enable e-mobility. Next slide, if you would, Tim. So moving from 30,000 feet down to some market research that I thought I might share with you. Um, we recently conducted a study at Connected Curb uh, we interviewed up to 1,500 different people from across the UK, and we looked at what are the highlights that we're hearing if we want people to transition to, let's just call it electric vehicles at this point. Why is that important? If you look at the government's 10-step plan for carbon neutrality, by far and away, the largest part of that sector relates to cars on the road, relates to the rolling stock and the national fleet. 300 million tons have got to be taken out which, by the way, equates to more than all of the other nine initiatives the government have outlined. So to that end, it's rather important to understand what is the public perception. And the public perception is 84% of people say, look, we need more charging infrastructure, public charging infrastructure, as well as private charging infrastructure. Why? Well, because a huge number of people, the vast majority in the UK, haven't got the ability to install their own charge point. They may not have a driveway, they may not be able, using the infrastructure available in their location, to install a charge point. So the burden of that falls on the government and ultimately will fall on public-private partnership. Nevertheless, 67% of people who have bought an EV wouldn't have done so had they not had the ability to charge. Other key thing that I thought I'd share with you, at-home charging is by far and away and will continue to be by far and away the most popular way in which people charge their vehicle. And at-home charging doesn't just mean Paul on his driveway. It could mean anybody being able to charge at or near where they live. And that means the deployment of quite literally millions of nodes across the UK that will enable ubiquitous charging accessibility for anybody that wants to make that transition to EVs and to e-mobility. And then final, point, final piece of the pie here is there's this popular misconception that people are going to go to destinations, pay 40 quid to charge their car up and have a horrible cup of coffee. Guess what? That isn't the case. The case is people want to charge their car where there's long dwell time, where the car's standing idle for more than six or eight hours, where they can get a, a cost-effective, economically viable and effective charge that supports what they do ordinarily. Okay, so those are the headlines from the research that we conducted couple of other things that I guess we've learned in the last four or five years, and these are really headlines that apply to every stakeholder in the business. Front and center, consumer education, convenience and confidence are the defining factors in how you cause successful transition to e-mobility. And let me not disavow you with any, anything else. That is the most important thing we collectively can do, educate the consumer, incent the consumer, support the consumer, and change consumer behavior. If you do that successfully, everything else will flow. 
Next thing, if you're going to spend all this money putting infrastructure in the ground, for goodness sake, grasp the opportunity to use other technologies that will equally support different service delivery. By that, I mean different types of things, and everybody's raving about Internet of Things, but connected devices that generate data that improve the quality of service delivery and the economics of that. Third thing, if you can't walk the walk and eat your own dog food, you shouldn't bother. So to the extent that it's possible, use recycled materials and ensure that when your products reach the end of life, be they cars, charge point, or anything else, figure out how you're going to recycle effectively so that it goes back into the circular green economy. Fourth, and I mentioned this previously, stay ahead of innovation. Don't expect it to slow down. It won't. And then finally, if none of this makes sense commercially, it's going to be harder to do. So define the new business models, understand them, help create them. And if you do, we'll expedite this whole process. Next slide, if you would, Tim. Actually, I won't bore you with that. That's pure sales speak, and today isn't the day for that. Um, so I think I'll leave it there, if I, if I may, and um, I'm delighted to pass over, I think, to Magnus. Thank you, Paul. Yes, no, that was great. Yes, Magnus, fill us in on biofuels and where they fit into the mix. Thanks, Paul. Um, am I sharing my screen? Thank you. Uh, that's not my screen. Hello, Tim. It's, sorry, it's just this three, there's a three three Magnuses there, oddly in the uh, attendees. Uh, you've obviously uh, logged in. Black screen, wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Um, and uh, I'm very honoured and very pleased to um, be invited onto this panel um, to talk about transition pathways to net zero. Um, and what a wonderful day to be doing that post um, yesterday's uh, announcements uh, by government. Um, we see this uh, transition in short, medium, and long term. Uh, perspective as, as all the panelists have said and um, we see that uh, advanced fuels have a um, have a phenomenal uh, place to play within uh, within tra transition from uh, where we sit today which uh, not quite a peak diesel uh, or peak fossil uh, to a net zero uh, world of 2050 um, and hope hitting some of the deadline for that. Magnus, I don't think your screen's showing. Okay. It's okay, my screen. Uh, yep, is that that's it. My my apologies. Um you, so, you're all uh, uh, I'll move, move, move on to the next slide then, all right? Um, so, um, we all want to make a difference today. Um, that's been echoed both by government policy and everything that we've said today. We have targets and, and, and we need to provide some solutions. And obviously what we've heard from the other panelists is that uh, there is a, there's a definite um, uh, um, but there is a there is a runway to get to those that, those points. There's infrastructure to be built, and there's pathways to be trodden in order for industry and business to make the right choices uh, to, to net zero. Um, obviously, you know we're all passionate about decarbonising both fleets and transport networks, uh, along with other uh, power provisions. Um, and really, that's where we see the role of uh, advanced fuels, um, and uh, that's what we do as a business. So the current solutions that are out there. Uh, government has mandated uh, a bio blend of diesel to start that that pathway. We're we're well into uh, the thirteenth year of that inclusion. We then have drop-in diesel replacements like green BHVO, which substitute uh, fossil diesel for renewable sustainable fuels. Um, that's kind of a here and now uh, solution with no capex uh, requirement and very light infrastructure. And as I said, there's a short, medium, and long term. The short 
short-term application of that is to support the transport, transport network, both uh, commercial fleets um, and uh, the rail infrastructure networks uh, to, to pathway to alternatives. But it gives us a here and now, an immediate um, reduction in, in, in our carbon intensity of those networks. We then have LNG uh, or, or, or um, uh, biogases. Once again, those have their place to play and that we've seen the rollout of uh, that technology and sadly sometimes showing that, the, that as we transition, we need to make sure that the infrastructure is robust in order to take on um, the challenges. I think we've heard from both Bill and, and, and actually Simon around electricity networks and obviously SSE's um, uh, move to the renewable space and, and more and more renewable energy on the grid allowing for a lower carbon intensity for, for electric vehicle charging but then also from Philip the need for the infrastructure to be put in place to allow that. And where we as a business see the transition or the long the transition on the larger vehicles would be um, the hydrogen networks and uh, hydrogen being um, currently probably grey but in the long in the, in, in the short and medium term renewable hydrogens probably taking the slack for the larger uh, vehicle classes. So this is kind of a you know a sort of what percentage of GHG saving or how quickly do these, the, these alternatives get us to, uh, to, to the net zero goals? And once again, um, there's merit in all of these technologies um, moving away from fossil diesel. Um, however, as, we, uh, as I said, as um, uh, we transition to electricity and hydrogen and biogas, in the interim, we need to we need to take action now, and we need to reduce uh, carbon intensity of our application. So the short-term application for advanced fuels will go into the road networks, the rail networks, and infrastructure and construction. That will then transition to the larger sizes of vehicles or the larger power plants, and ultimately sit in in those that can't transition effectively. So it will end up being the short-term solution and end up being into uh, aviation and marine as a long-term solution. This was just a, a very interesting slide that we've started to look at and it, it just kind of shows where the carbon intensity is today but not where it will be in the next five years of, of the different alternatives. Diesel being 100% of the emissions, CNG, uh, electric EV um, and then actually advanced renewable sustainable fuels actually contributing least uh, GHG um, emissions uh, within the process. So what is, what, what, what is an advanced fuel? Uh, in, in this case we're talking about uh, Green D Plus which is an HVO, hydro treated vegetable oil. Um, it is a, it, it is a it's, um, Total drop-in replacement, no capex requirement uh, within um, within the infrastructure, and it, it sits absolutely side by side as a replacement for diesel rather than an alternative powertrain. Short-term solution for decarbonising um, in 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 the road fleets. Two principal advantages: one is for every litre of diesel displaced, uh, one saves 2.83 kilograms of CO2e. Um, so an immediate impact from the CS, CSR point of view, but actually local air quality, and we've heard the importance for local air quality as well within all the presentations. So we see particulate matter at the tailpipe dropped by 85%, nitrous oxides by up to 30%. Um, so, so what does that mean from a sort of a balance of energy perspective? So for one vehicle currently running on um, fossil diesel, you're able to run 12 vehicles on Green D to have the same carbon impact, so a 12th impact. Um, applications, and sometimes worth just looking at why, you know, who's done what, and, and, and you know, 
do those early adopters create the um, the uh, ability to help the transition to the other technologies that we've heard about? So Hobus uh, became started running on uh, HBO over, just over three years ago. Um, key key, at, key attribute is they wanted to decarbonise their fleet um, and saw this as a way of doing that or significantly reducing the carbon intensity of their fleet. Since they started this program, they now have run over 30 million miles, reducing their CO2 impact by 24,000 metric tons. So a brilliant here and now story, um, and showing sort of the versatility, but also the ability for advanced fuels to give industries and companies uh, one way to connect technologies. Uh, Similarly, uh, a, waste, uh, a waste fleet, um, Acne Borough Council, um, and once again, motivated by reduction in carbon, um, unable to actually make a, uh, a business case, and as we heard from Paul, that is a very important aspect of transition, um, but unable to make a business case to move to an electric dust cart at that point in time, but obviously passionate about moving in that, that direction of travel, but wanting to make a difference immediately. So, you know, basically it's a here and now solution um, that will help business road fleets decarbonize and take some of the pressure off the immediate decisions that they need to make to allow them to make measured um, and smart uh, choices. So, in, in summary, an immediate impact, an improvement in local air quality as well as the global uh, reduction of greenhouse gases, no capital expenditure, allowing our existing assets to actually go to end of life, um, life cycle carbon obviously being an important aspect within uh, all transition technologies. Allowing people time to assess new technologies and move towards those technologies uh, with their eyes open and making the right choices and the right pathway decisions for their industries. Through long term uh, applications and available throughout the UK. So as an assistance point rather than the solution. We're not suggesting that we shouldn't transition to the other technologies. We're suggesting that we just need to give a, a helping hand along the way in this journey to net zero. Thank you I very can, much. Are you, are you finished? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Great. No, thank you. Right. Um, let's kick off with some questions. Um, there was actually a problem about the screen size, Magnus. On the, uh, um, it wasn't an audience view or presenter view or something. It was, but um, if you're okay with that, we can make slides available to all the attendees afterwards, if that's okay with you. Absolutely fine. Apologies for that. Um. Yes, let's get straight into. We've got a couple of questions lined up already. There's, uh, it said, uh, the first one's 15 years ago. I attended a presentation at the Houses of Parliament that said it would cost 15 billion to upgrade the existing distribution and transmission network, and another five billion to protect it against climate change. No idea what the numbers would be now, but where's the money coming from to meet the future doubling of electricity demand that you said today? Uh, you referenced for that, didn't you? So yeah, uh, do you want to try that first, Philip? I don't know. It's, where, where's the money coming from? So ultimately, like everything, it'll be paid for by us. Um, it's going to be something that uh, consumers and taxpayers will pay for one way or another, either through our our, our, our tax bills or through the uh, the price that we pay for the energy that we use. We're already paying for it through the uh, allocation of. Uh, uh, various costs into the uh, fixed cost component of the electricity bills that we pay um, every month at home. Um, so the challenge is how we make sure that the amount that it costs uh, is is kept as low as possible. And that's where 
the, the you know opportunities like smart charging, managed charging, potentially vehicle to grid technologies, all of these things become critically important. The innovation that uh, uh, Paul spoke to so powerfully uh, around uh, new technologies emerging uh, that will be uh, will enable people to access the energy uh, at uh, at lower cost and with greater uh, convenience will play through. Um, uh, I mean, so uh, and, and and we have to remember, right? We've already made huge strides in decarbonizing our existing electricity generation. Uh, so we've got about 10 gigawatts of uh, of offshore renewable electricity already on the they're paid for uh, through contracts for difference but what's really important to understand is that uh, the contract for difference price so the price that happened at the last uh, round of, uh, of, of bids to put in uh, offshore wind capacity to the UK is actually lower than the current cost of generating uh, uh, electricity from uh, natural gas plants uh, so we're getting to a point where renewable electricity generation is actually cheaper than fossil fuel electricity generation. That's a really important thing to bear in mind because what that, that is a function of scale and innovation coming together to drive down costs. The input costs for renewables are zero. It's all about the capital cost and then the distribution and transmission costs and the, uh, and the premium or, or discount needs to apply uh, around making sure that that electricity is available in our plugs exactly when we need it. Um, so, so that's kind of where we are. I'm, I'm quite optimistic uh, that we're in into an environment where the uh, generation costs are getting lower and lower and lower. Of course, all we're doing is displacing one form of energy with another. So as we spend more money on buying electricity, we will be spending less money on buying fossil fuels. Those, those, so the marginal cost of production is coming down. And as I said earlier, in terms of then making sure that our storage and distribution costs are kept as low as possible, uh, that's where applying smart technologies to enable us to make sure that we're all able to benefit from having the electricity when we need it, but it works in a way that works well with the grid is, 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 is the other key component. So um, I'm pretty optimistic, actually, that we'll be able to get through this transition in a affordable way when we look at the pluses and minuses of the overall transition. Yeah, and, and the key thing there to remember is costs are coming down and the more money we put into electricity, less money we'll have to spend on fossil. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that one next. I think I think it's first worth reflecting upon the uh, the change in nature of, of the, the networks over the last period. I think to 15 years ago you went to, to Parliament um, was the question. Obviously a lot's happened even five years ago. It would probably be possible to argue that the EV transition was still debatable. It's not now. Uh, but the requirement on the networks has certainly changed and the way the networks are operated has certainly changed. Um, I, I think actually we'll see over the, over the, the next five to ten years increased private investment in assets connected to the networks, and I think it's worth calling out activities like the opening up of the IDNO, Independent Distribution Network Operator Activities, which, which is driving competition in those networks and driving in other finance um, and investment options. Um, I think the key to, to, to those wider networks from the national grid right down to, to individual usage is distributed energy um, usage and efficiency um, and, and the assets are being used in a way which is beneficial to all at the end of the end of the table. Um, and I think we're seeing that and our business might, might have been this title actually of our business unit is distributed energy and, and that the whole system thinking approach is central to what we do. So everything can't be done in isolation. You know, fleets, energy, rail networks, aviation, they're all aligned in some ways in the technology. And, and we need to make sure that the way we deploy that, those networks is, is benefiting everybody. I think that's, that's a key point to make. And I think the, the deployment of smart tech and data will underpin all of that. You know, knowing what an asset needs, when it needs it, and, and mapping the generation, which is obviously far less consistent if it's not just burning things, if it's waiting for the sun to shine or uh, the wind to blow. Uh, measuring and monitoring that and, and distributing that energy to the right assets at the right time and, and buffering that with, with batteries and storage 
where it's suitable, and that will help us ultimately, hopefully, keep the costs under control. And then, as Phil quite rightly pointed out, the actual primary input is is free. It's only the assets we've got to pay for. We're not paying to buy something, you know, mine it, refine it, and then burn it. We're just collecting it and passing it through. So, in theory, it will continue to improve. So, um, one of the aspects of uh, the future scenarios is the vehicle to grid um, charging. You mentioned flexibility there and so on. Uh, and obviously, using this vast array when uh, of EVs everywhere, whether in fleets or domestically. I just didn't know if any of you had experience of what people's attitudes are, because obviously the battery is a large part of the value of the car, and do you really want a third party charging and discharging it, you know, without your knowledge and so on, and, uh, you know, are you comfortable with someone else doing that? I don't know. Paul, yeah, I, I, sorry, the Paul. Oh, no, go on. Oh, maybe he's not connected anyway. Okay, go, carry on. Um, I, I think what, from what, from my experience in, in the various uh, vehicle grid projects I've looked at, I, I did some early work with Nuve, um, who were, were an early early market entrant to the to the sector, um, and obviously with our on Sunderland Park work with Go Ahead. Actually, you know the the impact on the battery of vehicle to grid is it, you know you are cycling the battery, you are having a part of the use of the active life of that battery, but it's not detrimental, it's not causing um, notable um, degradation on the battery. And if it drives economic benefit, which it can, then there's, there's a reason to do it. I, I think you'll see increasingly, um, as the use case is proven, an increase in that. I think vehicle to grid is something that will enable people to be more confident that what they're buying and the technology they're implementing is making a difference. And I think that the vehicles will become active assets and a part of the grid. So we will less so see them as buses that are, you know, being connected and Additionally, well, well, kind of contrary to that, we will see buses as assets within the grid. So temporarily they're disconnected and then they're back and they provide a load which we account for um, within that flexibility. Um, and I, I think that will increase over time. I think it's a confidence thing. And I think also, you know, we have to remember that the supply chain of, of vehicles hasn't been um, perhaps as, um, as, as, as quick as we would have liked. So there would have been more projects, I think, if there were more vehicles available. What do you think, uh, either Philip or Andy, if you, you've got experience with what actual consumers think, or drivers rather? Yeah, I think um, there's, there's a lot of really interesting projects going on at the moment. So colleagues at Cenex, people within what was the ETI and now the uh, Energy Systems Catapult have, uh, have looked at some of these aspects, and there's a number of projects running as we speak. I, I think a few things that are worth remembering. Number one, uh, the power that you're transferring back and forth is relatively low power relative to the sort of consumption of power on the vehicle um, you know I've got an electric vehicle it's a sort of 100 kilowatt rated but as a vehicle to grid tool it's sort of uh, you know seven or eight kilowatt rated typically um, so it's actually quite a gentle process on the vehicles um, and there is anecdotal evidence that that, that actually stabilizes and, and arguably increases the life of batteries rather than the very aggressive fast charging I mean it's it's all anecdotal um, there's also a tension that I think is really interesting about, and I mentioned it, a strategy to try and sweat the assets more effectively. You know, a battery is really, really good when it's being sweated. What it does is give, deliver zero emission miles on the road, but when it's static, and our cars currently are static 96% of the time, it's actually uh, less valuable. So we've got this tension between, let's say, a taxi that you want to be running and do, doing zero emission miles as much as possible and then the opportunity for vehicle to grid which relies on it being plugged in for quite a long period of time uh, one of the projects has incentivized people for how long they plug in so that as long as they can guarantee to plug in at say four o'clock and be there available for the peak uh, and then able to charge up until six o'clock in the morning you can generate some uh, some revenue but if you only plug in and you need your charge at five o'clock in the evening actually you're going to pay a premium for your electricity so there's some really interesting tensions here. Should we have this extra battery capacity on the vehicle that's being carried around, or should it be in homes and, and go for a smaller, you know, should you have 15 kilowatt hours in your home and 15 kilowatt hour less in your vehicle so that you, you use that? It's a, a really, really interesting space. Um, I think it'll end up being a blend of everything, as all of these things do. 
um, uh, but but certainly the the principle of using the battery as if you like as much as possible um, is is definitely the way to do it. That's that's what it's there to do is to really service uh, the energy transfer between where it's generated and the mobility uh, and how do we best do that. And uh, just to add to what Andy uh, and, and Simon have said, the modelling that we've done around the energy system value of vehicle to grid um, really says that you know that if if if, if you're all, it, it, it so much depends on the extent to which smart and managed charging is already commonplace. If you've got a lot of smart and managed charging on the system, in other words, people are drawing power from the grid at times when it's easy for the grid to supply it and, and the electricity is relatively cheap. The incremental value of vehicle to grid is significantly lower at a sort of a system level and therefore you know the, the price that could be offered uh, to a consumer uh, is presumably going to be smaller as a consequence. Um, but what Andy said about the uh, you know the, the, the timing of people being connected I think is the critical point here. The dilemma is that you know so intuitively it feels as though there will be peak time times of peak demand when vehicle to grid is going to have greatest value but you know there is a reason why there are times of peak demand and so a lot of people will be not that particularly well you know uh, driven to uh, plug their cars in at a time of peak demand because it's peak demand time for a reason uh, and and that's that's a, a, a sort of a central dilemma here around just understanding what the incremental value of vehicle to grid is smart and managed charging no brainer absolutely critical the incremental value of vehicle to grid is is yet to be really demonstrated and understood i think Okay. okay, I've got a question here which I assume is for you, Magnus, because all it says is, my understanding is that you get less miles per gallon. So I can only assume it's a biofuel question. No, 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 it's, that's for the EV charging lot, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, they don't get any miles per gallon um, on, on electric, obviously. Um, no, so um, long-term trials and, and, and uh, use case would would show that actually um, HBO is, is, is relatively flat from a fuel efficiency point of view um, with diesel. Um, and there are environments um, such as urban miles um, and idle speed um, applications where you see a, actually a, a fuel efficiency gain um, and uh, extra MPG. That's principally because you're seeing a, 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 lot, a lot cleaner combustion, i.e. a lot more of the fuel is, is, uh, emissions, tailpipe emissions are, are principally unburnt carbon, 80% uh, of the gases are unburnt carbon. And obviously if you can see a reduction in 80, of 80% 80 of uh, tailpipe emissions, that is a fuel efficiency gain and particularly in, in urban miles, uh, we, we, we do actually see um, significant benefits. Uh, obviously biofuels are, are something you can do now and it's, it's um, you know, it has its advantages in the sense you can drop it in. but. Do you see that, is it a transition fuel, transition to things like EVs, or will it have a place in the final, you know, 2050 landscape? I think um, it very much depends on the actual mode that, that, uh, and, and vertical that you're looking at, um, whether you see it in the 2050 landscape. We principally see it as a transition technology to, to, to actually today. Um, but we do see an environment where you'll see, um, you know, advanced biofuels in marine applications or, or, or even rail applications in those harder to, harder to transition to, um, arenas where actually um, the asset life cycle is a lot longer. So, for instance, road cars life cycle around about five years. Uh, heavy goods vehicles 10 to 15 year life cycle from, you know, from first first iteration. Um, so you can see the pathway as you move up that curve to larger asset sizes, you can see a reason for, for, for biofuels um, or advanced biofuels existing for longer. But this isn't instead of tech transition, this is just helping on that journey to net zero and that's a really important aspect of, of where it sits and lies um, within the debate. I think it's it's quite interesting that the government have actually increased 
the requirements for renewable fuels in the transport sector within the, the decarbonisation plan. So over the next uh, uh, 12 years up to 2032, they've actually increased the target, the obligation. So there's clearly a commitment to decarbonise the fuel we're using in the vehicles that are on the road at the moment. Uh, and as Magnus says, you know, a truck is, is uh, 15 years, cars typically are scrapped at 14 years. Um, and there's also an acknowledgement, and if you read the detail, there's an acknowledgement that they wish to get to zero tailpipe emissions on the road. So combustion in trucks, you know, the, the aim is to remove combustion uh, from trucks nominally. Um, but within the aviation sector, as an example, uh, everything at the moment says that it's going to be sustainable aviation fuel, SAF, which is essentially a liquid uh, synthetic version of the, the kerosene that you're, you're, um, uh, you're using now, but you can generate that with, from renewable electricity, direct carbon capture from the air, uh, through hydrogen. So there are ways, the technology to make net zero fuel exists. Um, we've, what we've got to do is to identify where that is necessary um, because we can't electrify it or run it on hydrogen because it's quite, you know, it's very energy intensive to make these fuels, these, these really sophisticated synthetic fuels. But in the near term, decarbonizing what we've got is the biggest win we can see over the next five to 10 years, probably, as we electrify the rest of the road fleet. Absolutely. Paul, are you with us? Are you, you've been having a few problems, I think. No, your sound, no. I'll ask this and Paul maybe can answer, but anyone else can jump in. It's a question that's come in. The majority of BEVs in the UK can only charge up at up to 7 or 11 kilowatts on the AC charger. However, many businesses do not understand that the vehicle limits AC charging speeds and several 22 kilowatt AC chargers are being installed. This takes up a lot of the supply capacity that will not actually be utilised. Anyone wish to comment on that? Are you on, Paul, or not? Yeah, it's a shame. Yeah, I don't know what. I, think I, 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 I wouldn't actually agree. Most of the, uh, well, all the BEVs that you, you buy today will be uh, at least 22 kilowatt AC uh, and will be 50 plus, typically 100 or plus kilowatt DC charging capability. The early days, there were some, I, I drive uh, a, a range extended vehicle that is limited in its AC capacity, but I bought that seven years ago. So, Seven kilowatts is typically all you can draw on a home charger. Um, so that is typically what you will be getting, unless you go to three phase in your home, which is an expensive upgrade usually. Um, seven kilowatts is the limit for your home chargers on an AC vehicle. Seven kilowatts, I mean, average mileage is something like 20 miles a day, uh, which is about three kilowatt hour, uh, sorry, about uh, six seven, or seven kilowatt hours. So you can charge up your mileage overnight uh, in, a, in an hour from a standard home charger. More than enough capacity to do that at a beneficial time for the grid. Um, but the, the cars you're buying today will charge much more rapidly um, than, than maybe some of the early ones uh, that, that they may be referring to, I think. I, th I think that we might take on, on that at the moment. I think, I think just to, to, to add to that, I think it is, uh, the, the, the point behind the question as well was, was the installations going in might not always be fit for purpose in some cases, and I think there's, there is a real importance in a proper collaborative approach between what's being designed for a location and what's actually required, and I've had uh, as, as someone living on the front line and, and talking through those operational deployments and the charger installations, I've had no end of conversations of the, the, the kind of reality of people go biggest, best, fastest, you know, put the top notch thing in and you say, is someone going to be parked there for nine hours? You, it doesn't matter how fast your charger is, they're going to be there all day, so they're blocking your charger. So I think there's probably a bit of education in, in, in the facilities and, uh, and fleet space to make sure that, that we're doing the right thing as organisations and, and, you know, when we're installing our own chargers, I had a conversation with, in regards to a railway station a long time ago. Um, and, and, and I suggested that probably, you know, even at you know, a commando socket level, uh, a charge would be sufficient and actually three, three and a half kilowatt split, seven kilowatt charges would be fine for the solution. And I was, you know, harangued about putting rapid charges in a big long line. And I said, well, the cost of that is just not realistic for commuters. And actually the, the average mileage, I think we mentioned there, Andy, of people driving to and from a location like that is five, ten miles in half an hour or an hour 
that it, even on a slow charger that you've got enough to cover your daily mileage. There's, there's a real education and a real importance in ensuring those assets that we're connecting are exactly what they need to be and that we're not going for you know the, the Rolls Royce solution when we can get away with a Mini. Briefly Andy, the chap who asked questions come back, he said please can he name those cars that can take 22 kilo, I've not seen many uh, at all, even Teslas don't do more than 11 kilowatts on AC charger, ID3 can only do a 7 kilowatt on an AC. So it's uh, uh, but by all means, uh, we'll, we'll take it offline. Uh, yeah, but I yeah. think um, I think there's uh, uh, you know a lot of capacity there that, that can be done. I think uh, Simon brings a good point, and particularly relevant for the fleet, is around. Um, it, it's such a, a you know it's a more integrated and complex discussion now. It's not just the fleet manager going and buying another diesel transit because he's bought them for the last forty years or whatever the transit's been around for. Um, it, he's got to get his facilities manager on board. He's got to get his finance director on board. You know who's buying the energy. You've got to get your drivers on board. You know, and never forget the guy on the, uh, the throttle pedal um, because you know they're the ones that can make or break any change that you implement. Um, but if you do that and really approach this, actually, the numbers stack up. Um, we're doing, and, and Phil, Phil, and, and, and the team within the Yvette program have looked specifically at the depot charging challenge, and there's a, there's a report coming out soon that's been developed with some really blue chip fleet leaders to look at ho uh, depot charging and indeed distributed home fleet charging. So a lot of these sort of uh, tradesmen, if you like, who need to charge at home and how do we do that? How do they get paid for their electricity? All of these things are absolutely being grappled with. So whatever questions you've got, I almost guarantee we can point you to someone who's asked that same question and started to develop some solutions. And I think that's the key thing about this space that Innovation is coming, but, but there's a huge amount of activity and learning, and part of our challenge is disseminating that learning effectively and as widely and rapidly as possible. Paul, any and quick I, Are you with us now? On the, uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, so I was just saying any views on the, the 22 kilowatt charging uh, with the idea that the, they take up a lot of supply capacity that might not be utilised because the cars can't actually use them. Yeah, I mean, there's a popular misconception that if I plug in at 22 kilowatts, I'm charging at 22 kilowatts and there's no local load balancing going on, which is a popular misconception that we should myth bust right now. That isn't how 22 kilowatt charges work, and more importantly, will they work once the new legislation kicks in, both at, you know, three phase and single phase for, for the home. So, um, 22 kilowatt charges have got a real purpose in life, and their purpose in life is to get a meaningful charge on board as soon as possible. A lot of this comes down to a conscientious consumer saying, I don't need to get a super fast charge at this point. My car's going to be stationary for 12 hours. I can take a three kilowatt charge, and I'm going to get a full battery, versus somebody who says, I need a priority. And there is technology that we and other CPOs employ today that does local balancing to grid, where we're able to manage a number of different charge point capacities from a single feed from the grid. And so I think that there are the requirements to have a balanced network right the way through to you know, 150 kilowatt and above. But the, it's, it's to look at how best you facilitate that mixed opportunity of charging based on the location of the charge point and its likely utilization. So if, you've, if you're going to face facts, if you're at a major uh, index of connectivity, you could be a motor rail service station or a major intersection where you've got a sort of a forecourt for charging, that's going to need mass capacity. If on the other hand you've got 22s deployed to enable a cluster of different charging opportunities closer to where people live or work, I think 22s are great and they have a purpose in life and they satisfy that purpose in life very well. So I don't see them as um, uh, an over drain on the grid, I see them as a necessary evil that enable people to get a charge when they most need it so that they can get from A to B. The, the key here is to make sure that we're using technology to optimize the available grid capacity and, and to fix point to do so in a manner that makes sense so that we're not having to over invest in infrastructure when technology can take the burden of that load balancing away. So um, I'm afraid I don't, I don't agree that 22 kilowatts are uh, a burden on, on the grid. I think if anything, they're um, something that helps expedite um, a realistic transition to, to EV charging. 
there's another question slightly about charging. Given the inevitable increase in demand for electricity, should we be looking at making phase supply into all new buildings which would facilitate home battery storage? I believe that Germany provided three phase for all domestic homes as standard. Is this correct? Uh, yes, the Germany statement is correct. And um, again, we've heard from some of the other panelists um, that, that this transition isn't just relating to uh, it's relating to buildings, it's relating to the future of how infrastructure will, will operate. And so, yes, of course, um, in the ideal world, we would mandate in planning a whole bunch of different things. The government's already done a great job of mandating new builds to have a minimum of a number of different charge points available per parking bag. So that will come, but, you know, this is evolution revolution. I guess the thing that I would... Uh, state here is that we're talking about a market at the moment that's less than 2% activated. We've got 98% of growth to go and we've got to learn to walk before we can run. So yes, that's an incredibly sensible thing to do and yes, Germany um, have managed to legislate faster but I think we'll catch up and I think pragmatism needs to be um, the driver, not legislation. And, uh, and just to, to add to that, I, I think we're spot on there. Um, you know, the thing that we have to remember is that I think it's something like 85% of the houses that we'll be living in in 2050 have already been built. Yeah. Uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 to just reinforce the pragmatism point, the real challenge is what we do to retrofit uh, our housing stock so that it is fit to, for purpose to support both the electrification of transport, but critically, potentially, in, in, in at least many parts of the country, not necessarily everywhere, uh, the electrification of heating as well, which will put a, a massive further load on the uh, on, on local networks and on the on, on the domestic fuse box. Philip, there's another question here that might be you. Sorry, Tim. I haven't touched on this. Do you think do you think that there will be an electric solution for haulage at scale? in the next 10 years? If not, what will fill the gap to decarbonize heavy lift road transport? I think I'm going to defer to Andy on that. I've got a point of view, but I suspect that Andy is, uh, is, is more au okay fait with it. Absolutely. What we're, see what we're seeing uh, as the strategies coming out from the, uh, the major OEMs and certainly the, uh, the, the insurgents, if I can call it that, in terms of the truck side, is that for light trucks, electrification is going to be the way forward. Battery electrification is clearly um, uh, you know, it's making a, a, a difference. Scania, Volvo, uh, Iveco, uh, you know, Volta, Arrival all have battery electric vehicles available in the sub 26 ton space. Um, we've got, we've now got electric uh, dust carts available from Dennis Eagle, from Renault, you name it, and, and you know they are working and working very effectively. So I think electrification in the light vehicles is going to be the natural choice. Up in the heavy end. Uh, it's a question that is, you know, exercising government, and they're doing something about that. They're going to be running the zero emission road freight program, uh, which is developing the plans this year. Uh, there's, there's funding, about 20 million of funding, to develop the plans for large scale trials in the 2022 to 2025 timeframe of um, hydrogen as a, an option in heavy long haul trucks or uh, overhead or you know catenary or on, on the fly charging if you want to put it that way so uh, both of which are being demonstrated in various places at the moment so the jury is out on whether we need hydrogen uh, and, and with hydrogen comes a lot of uh, inefficiency so you use probably three or four times as much uh, renewable electricity once you've passed it all the way through hydrogen and uh, compressed it and all that sort of thing uh, it's about three or four times as much to power your truck so given that inefficiency um, or penalty in energy consumption, the benefits need to outweigh that. And it, the question we've got to grapple with is whether the convenience, the range that you get, uh, the ability to charge, refill much, much faster, um, all of those things, whether those outweigh the energy loss. And that's, you know, it's genuinely a question. Uh, I'm not going to pick a winner at the moment, uh, but I'm absolutely going to support um, the, the process of finding out and scrutinize the data uh, from a very independent basis because that's the you know we've, we've got some very strong lobbies on both sides of that camp uh, and we do need a really independent approach to do that I think it's you know it's worth saying if we go for a large-scale hydrogen in road transport 
there are implications on the amount of electricity we've got to deliver uh, and indeed where we've got to deliver it to um, but you know it's it's something that we need to work out whether the uh, the, the uh, say the benefits outweigh the downsides uh, of that that option Simon does SSC have a view particularly on development is it hydrogen yeah, so I, 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 can't, I don't think I can give a view on hydrogen technology deployment. We're not, we're not actively deploying hydrogen ourselves at the moment. I think I just wanted to reflect on, on, on Andy's point around the kind of the options still being available and the options are open. And, and, and part of our activities at the moment are around deploying hubs. And I think the critical part of that, or a critical piece of that jigsaw, is deploying the right charging solutions in the right places. Um, and we're doing some work with big haulage organisations, looking at heavy goods vehicles to understand exactly what needs to be deployed. And actually, there appears at the moment from the work we're doing to be sense in putting nodal points for um, heavy good vehicle charging locations in specific places. Um, and, and the key is giving fleets operational certainty. So you know, if you've got right, the right charges that are available at the right time with the right power rating, it doesn't have a huge impact on that kind of just-in-time delivery model. It can be scheduled in and it can be built. Um, and I would personally argue, and this isn't a, a corporate position, I'd personally argue that's likely to be more cost efficient than building another separate fuel network because you're connecting the same electricity networks, the same assets, it can be aligned with the other deployment of, of uh, renewable technologies. So um, I think Andy's quite right, it's not, a, it's not a clear picture yet, that's why it's in the transport decarbonisation plan to say they're going to look into it, um, and it's got to be data driven. But um, I think arguably, if the charges are in the right places, then electrification of heavy goods is certainly possible. Okay, just a very brief, because we're running low on time, but there's another question back to biofuel about, um, uh, biofuel is great, but where will the land come from to meet the future transition needs? It will compete with food production on the same land. Someone wants to grow crops for biofuel, and this will push food prices up. Okay, so um, there's two types, uh, there's two sources. Uh, of the feedstocks for biofuels, one is virgin crop and the other is waste derived um, uh, product. Um, we would all support waste derived um, feedstocks um, because of their land use uh, application, um, but also because of the carbon intensity. And I think to Andy's point earlier around the gov government's mandate uh, for increasing the bio uh, content within uh, regular fossil diesel, uh, we see a huge value in rather than producing um, methyl ester based biodiesels, which is the traditional diesel, one should be producing paraffinic uh, renewable diesels, synthetic it's, it's synthetic diesels, as Andy put it, um, because the quality of the fuel is a lot better, the energy um, efficiency of the fuel is better, and the net result of combustion is also better from an environment, local environmental point of view. So. All we're saying is that you take the same feedstocks that's going into metal ester beds, which would be the blend ratio, and actually you put that into um, the, the energy mix for liquid fuels rather than into a, 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 you know, a, a mediocre product, put it into a better product. Right, we're running low on time, and uh, anyone whose questions aren't answered, I can forward them on to the panel uh, subsequent to this. But uh, just bring Paul in as soon as he's here. <laughs> Here at last, it, 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 there's another one about V to G, and you didn't really give your views on that. And it's um, it says about it, we have a hybrid PHEV, so plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, and we would not be happy for any V to G activity scheduled by a third party. Yeah, I think, I think well, again, a bit of Point is plugging your hybrid battery in because it's not going to have the capacity to make, really to move the needle at all. So that's the first thing to say. The second thing I guess is remember that a lot of the battery technology we're talking about today is first generation battery tech. There's no NASA tech that's really become mainstream at this point. But there are some very clear pieces of constantly charging and discharging a battery can have a material impact on its life. Um, but long term, um, I think you have to look at the business model before you start to uh, make a opinion or opinion on the business paradigm. The business paradigm is: Can I use mobile batteries in vehicles to create microgrids to support the, the the main grid? So that question is yes. Will people own cars in the same way that in today, or will there be 
outcomes which don't ship? Will there be major fleets that will seek to that sort of transition? I think, I think we're judging technology as it exists today, not technology as it will be in quite 10 years' time, but the cash efficiency today is going to be much greater. And where car ownership and distributed contribution to grid and development of microgrid becomes compelling. You know, all you have to do is look at look at a standard fleet car park. Those those vehicles fully charged, lying idle overnight, or lying idle during peak time when they could be making a massive contribution and reducing the company's electricity burden or bill. Yeah, I think people will make that transition. I think the technology isn't ready yet, but I think the the uh, ability of for people to adopt the technology when it's available will be there, and I think that they'll be there willing. Great. No, thank you all so much for your time today, and thank you, audience, for listening. It's just a reminder, Net Zero Week runs from Saturday to Friday next week, and we have over 35 free-to-attend virtual events exclusively curated for Net Zero Week to help you on your Net Zero journey. Specifically on transport, don't miss Zemo Partnership's virtual annual conference on Tuesday, the 20th of July, running from 11 till 4. Details can be found on netzeroweek.com. And lastly, a big thank you to all partners and sponsors, over 50 collaborators, who have made the National Awareness Week possible, in particular Northern Gas and Power and our principal sponsor, and Hitachi ABB Grids, our co-sponsor. But thank you all panellists, and thanks for listening. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.